I looked at my daughter and realized that there was only really one option. And I wanted to make sure that she knew what a strong woman looked like and how we were gonna get through this with our faith and with our family. I had found out that my husband had committed suicide on January 22nd, the night before we had been looking for him. He just wasn't acting like himself. So in that moment, I just felt like the rug had kind of been taken out from under me. I felt like we had this life that we had created together and I wasn't sure what was gonna happen. I wasn't sure what the next day was gonna look like. In that moment when you're told what you've lost, I just looked around and the room was full. It was full of love still. My parents were there, my aunt and uncle were there, my closest friends were there, Pastor Jeff was there. That's how God revealed himself to me. He was like, look around at these blessings that you still have. Hi, Throughout all of this, I've always wanted Maeve to know that she's loved and that yeah. that will never ever change. Even though something was taken from us, she's still loved by, by God most importantly. I think a lot of times people say that they understand, but there's like moments in the day where you just can't pick up and call somebody. When Maeve was doing this funny dance in the kitchen, I couldn't send a video to my husband. So it's like parts of your day that just become kind of lonely. It's those little moments that become difficult. When I had taken some time off of work after all of this, I tried to work more with Radical Love, which is a ministry that helps with refugee families and seniors in our community. and. I think that helping people was a good way to channel that energy and to not feel so lonely. If I could give something to someone, then it made me not feel so empty. With Radical Love, there's a lot of families that are coming from very tragic situations. So I do feel like a connection to that. I just think about some of the things that these people have gone through and have overcome, and it gives me strength. Community has always been very important to me. I don't think I leaned on my community. I was more of the helper. And the tables really turned this last year. And I needed the help. And I needed the support and the love and the friendship. I was given that back tenfold than what I've ever given anyone. I don't know how I would have done anything without leaning on God or the community. It's amazing the people that God puts in your life to move you forward on your path. When we share our stories with each other and just live in community with people that are very different from us but are still a lot of the same. We're all mothers, we're all fathers. We all live in an Instagram society where Everything is photo touched and airbrushed and everything looks perfect, right? And life is not like that. <laughs> life is very messy. And I think the more that we talk about it, it normalizes that and makes it okay. It's not easy to share the most difficult part of my life. Grief is interesting because you never get over it. You move through it. I don't know how people grieve without God. I can't imagine not having God during something like this. I don't I don't even know what that would look like.
as Abby mentioned, it was a, a, a sacred privilege to be there with her, fa- her and her family at that darkest hour. And I just want to tell you, I, I saw so many Chapel Streeters come around her. And I was so grateful for the family of God and how he, uh, through his people, filled up what was lacking and continues to do so. And really, uh, Abby, her strength and her faith in Christ and um, her perseverance has been an encouragement to me and to many who know her as well. I love what she said about when I got outside of myself and started to serve others who were also in desperate situations and have been through hard things, God began to fill up what I thought I was missing, the emptiness. He does that, doesn't he? He fills us up in ways that when we think we lack something. And that really brings us to the introduction to our series called Colossians, The Fullness of God. God's uh, grace fills us up Last week, we looked at the resurrection. It was a week ago, by the way. And in case you've forgotten, he's still risen. And not just once upon a time or once a year. He's still the risen and reigning king. And I think maybe the great question we could ask is, okay, so Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and now it's a week later, and it's 47, and it's raining, and it's not 82 anymore. So what? So what difference does it make in my life? The great so what? I think the book of Colossians is a perfect answer to that question. What does it mean to live a full life in Christ? Which of us doesn't want to live a full life, a complete life? And Colossians is is Paul's letter to this little church and to us about what it means to live a full life, filled up to overflowing by the grace of the risen Jesus. Let's pray and we'll jump in together. Father, thank you for Abby's story and her courage to even tell it to us. Thank you for the way you are sustaining her and her family. Thank you for your church who has come around her. And for all of us who carry burdens, who feel weighed down, who feel like we're empty, that you fill us with your grace in all kinds of ways, not the least of which through your, through your word, by your spirit, we pray that you would fill us this morning as we open our hearts to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if I had a uh, theme, uh, we have a theme across all of our campuses launching this new series this week, uh, the Colossians, the fullness of God. Here's how I want to say it. The fullness of God is in Christ. Christ is the fullness of God. And we are to be filled up in him. So the, the fullness w- that we seek, when you think you lack something, everything you need to be filled up to overflowing is already provided for you in Christ Jesus. He is the fullness of God, and those of us who are in him are filled to overflowing. That's the theme that runs straight through this entire letter. Everything we need for a full life we already have in Christ. We'll see it in Colossians 1.19. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. In Colossians 2, verses 9 through 10. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Over and over again we're going to see this theme that he's the fullness. So, a little background here. Colossians, a letter written by the Apostle Paul, who wrote about three quarters of the New Testament. He wrote this letter to a group of Christians, a church, a little house church, in the city of Colossae. Uh, And, by the way, it's only four chapters long. How long do you think it would take you to read through the whole Bible if you read straight through? How many hours? Take a while and stab in the dark guess. Anybody? (laughs) Maybe you've never done it, right? (laughs) It would take you less than 60 hours straight through reading time. You can do it. Read the Bible. And if you're wondering where to start, hey, start in Colossians. You can do that this afternoon. You can go home today before the Cubs play at three, because we're all going to be paying attention to that. And you can open your Bible, and you can read Colossians, the four chapters. One of the shortest letters Paul wrote, one of the most exciting and powerful letters Paul wrote. Let's read that together. Little little, uh, spoiler alert. Next week, we're going to challenge you to memorize Colossians 1, 15 through 20. If you've never memorized scripture, we're going to challenge you to do that. We'll get to that next week. So Paul's writing to an ancient people in a different part of the world, this letter to a church, but it's remarkably relevant and profoundly important for us today. A little background here. See a map on the screen. This is uh, Paul uh, writing to Colossians. Anybody know who Paul was before he's Paul? Saul of Tarsus. Okay, good look at you. You're like Bible scholars. Um, let me see, what should we use here? There we go. Okay, so Tarsus is right here. That's where Paul's from. Jerusalem below Damascus. The center of Christianity had expanded to Antioch. You can read about that in Acts chapter 15. And then it begins to spread through Asia Minor. This is modern day Turkey, Asia Minor today. 
Here's Colossae. And here's the, the great city of Ephesus. So Paul is writing to a church in Colossae where he's never been, and as far as we know, would never visit. The church was started by a man named Epaphras. We'll find out about him in the letter. Epaphras is from Colossae. Apparently, he'd been to Ephesus 110 miles to the west, and he'd heard Paul preach the gospel in Ephesus. Paul started the church in Ephesus, left Timothy, his younger brother in the faith, to lead that church. Epaphras had been there, been converted to faith in Jesus by Paul's preaching of the gospel, goes back to his hometown. And by the way, Colossae is, by the time Paul writes this letter, it's, a, it's kind of a nothing town. It's declining in its economic and cultural influence. Laodicea is uh, nearby, uh, just one of the close cities along the Lycus River. And Colossae is really, it's sort of in, inconsequential. Small town that's waning in influence and in population, small house church there. Yet Paul writes to them. Ephesus is the most excavated city in the ancient world because there's nobody living there. It's a massive, incredible place. I can't wait to be there this June with some of our Chapel readers traveling to Turkey and we'll visit that place. Colossae may be among the most least excavated cities of the ancient world. You'll see an image here of Colossae today on the screen. If we can skip. That's it. A hillside with a few ruins at the top of that hill. Not much there to speak of. Because about three years after Paul wrote this letter, the, that region of the world was devastated by a massive earthquake in 62 or 63 AD. There's not much left. The time Paul wrote this letter, the city's already in decline. Epaphras, who is converted to faith in Jesus, goes back to his hometown, preaches the gospel, people come to faith, and a little house church starts. A few dozen people in a tiny town. Epaphras hears about Paul's imprisonment in Rome, where he writes this letter from, and he goes to visit Paul and actually gets imprisoned with him. And right around the 10-year anniversary of the birth of this little church, Paul writes this letter that we're going to read through over the next several weeks to this little house church. Now, why take the time to write this letter to this small church in a nothing town? Why? Why? Well, it's, it's, it, he has profound things to say to them and to us through them, which we'll see, about what it means to live the full life in God, wherever God has placed you. Just imagine, by the way, what it must have been like for them to, to find out that the apostle Paul wrote them a letter. Can you imagine? He knows about us. He knows that we exist. He has something to say to us. Because letters of the New Testament, which we read as the Bible, were circulating in this, in this time. They would have gathered together to pray, to sing hymns, to hear the, the teaching of Jesus, the gospel accounts, and then they find out Paul wrote to us to hear his words. What did he have to say? What does he want to say to us? That's how we should approach hearing this letter today. Okay, let's look at the first couple of verses. Colossians chapter one, verses one through two. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Now, if, you're, uh, if you've read through some of Paul's letters before, this should sound very familiar. This is his salutation and greeting. But it's not, it's, we can skip right over it and think, oh, he's just, he's just kind of flowery speech, kind of greeting them. There's a lot that's important for us, even in Paul's greeting to the Colossians. First, Paul says, uh, uh, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. Oh, what have I done? I've messed it up. He says that he is by the will of God. Somehow I've lost a little thing in there. Anyway, by the will of God. So Paul, this is a crucial phrase. Paul's an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Paul sees his whole life, his identity, his authority, and his purpose as given by the will of God. N nobody saw Saul of Tarsus as a, a likely apostle. Nobody's predicting that. Nobody's planning that. Paul, Saul wasn't. Saul, if you don't know, before he becomes Paul the New Testament, is committed as, as, a, as a zealous Jew, Pharisee, to stamping out the Christian message and the gospel. Now he sees himself as an apostle of the gospel of Christ Jesus by the will of God. His identity and his purpose and his mission exist by the will of God. You and I are not apostles, but I would suggest to you that your life, 
where you live, your career, your friendships, your influence, your sphere is by the will of God. We think of our lives as like, well, I live where I live because I chose it. You know, we, by the way, behind our name, Chapel Street Church, every house, a chapel on its street. God's placed you where you live, not because you chose it, by his sovereign will. Where did you choose where you live? Well, maybe you think, well, the, well probably not the taxes in Illinois, but, you know, the school system, proximity to whatever, you know. No. I live where I live. I have the job that I have, the friends that I have, by the will of God. Do you think of your life, your identity, purpose, and, and function in the world as existing by the will of God? Or do you think of it as like, well, I've got my agenda, and then God's sort of helping me with that. Paul says, I am who I am by the will of God. Next he says, to the saints, whoop, go back one slide, I messed up. There we go. To the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. This is crucial, in and at. So, do you think of yourself as a saint? Who are saints? Well, saints are super Christians, right? They're the uber spiritual. No. Paul says to this little house church in the middle of nowhere, you are the saints. In other words, if you have given your life to Jesus, you've trusted him for forgiveness of your sins, it doesn't mean you have your life all together, you get everything right. It means that you know that your only hope for this life and for eternity is the Lord Jesus Christ. You are a saint in the Lord. Turn to your neighbor and, said, and say, you are a saint in the Lord. <laughs> Does it feel a little awkward? <laughs> You're probably like, well, maybe not, not maybe him, not her. <laughs> It's uncomfortable. We don't think of ourselves as saints. Saints are not super Christians. Saints are those who've been redeemed by Jesus and belong to him. Paul says to this little church, you're saints in the Lord. I greet you as such. And then he says, in Christ at Colossae. Why is that important? Your identity is in Christ. Your location is the city of Colossae. I'm in Christ at Batavia Avenue, Batavia, Illinois. Well, that's not you, that's my address. In other words, my identity should inform my geography, not the other way around. This is crucial. Where you live has no impact on your identity in Christ, but your identity in Christ should have tremendous impact on where you live. This is what Paul is saying. This is who you are. You are saints in Christ. You happen to live here, and that should impact where you live and the people you interact with. Okay, let's walk through the next several verses of this amazing letter and see how Paul lays out th these things. The truth of the gospel, the life of the gospel, and the power of the gospel. First, the truth of the gospel. Basic consensus among uh, New Testament scholars is the church in Colossae was facing some sort of um, uh, false teaching, a bit of a crisis. It's not crystal clear what that was, but Colossae it, it, it was placed along the Lycus River Valley. And this is a place where a lot of Jews that left Jerusalem and spread in Asia Minor settled. And so what appears to be happening is that they had converted the faith in Jesus by Epaphras teaching of the gospel. And then over time, 10 years, they begin to adopt other things, other views. Sort of Jesus and his death and resurrection plus Jewish mysticism, plus these other practices. And, and Paul's never been there, but he knows about this. And he's saying, the best thing I can say to you is hold fast to Jesus. You don't need anyone or anything else. And I think that's profoundly relevant for us today. I think it's very common for people in the contemporary American church to think faith in Jesus plus, what is it, right? We add things. We think we need a little something more. Like the guy, I, I've told this story many times before when I was coaching flag football. My, my son was involved in the team and I, one of the dads of one of his teammates said, found out I was a pastor and said, oh, you're a pastor. I should come to your church. I could use a little Jesus in my life. I said, oh, well, he wants to be in your life, but he's not little. There's no such thing as a little Jesus in your life. Like he's an add-on to your life. Like I've got my life coach and my career plans and my, uh, you know, my gym membership and my personal trainer. And then, oh yeah, I could use a little spirituality, a little Jesus. That's not how it works. He's either coming in to take over or not at all. And Paul's saying to the Colossians, don't lose your grip on what matters most. The gospel of Jesus Christ, in him, you already have all you need. Let's look at verses three through eight. 
of the text. So, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and that of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel. You underline a couple of things here. The word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed the whole world is bearing fruit and increasing as it does also among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. So Paul's saying, look, we praise God for you. We've heard about you. What has he heard? He's heard about their love for one another. Well, what would, if Paul was going to write a letter to Chapel Street Church today, what would he hear about us? What a great thing that he says, I know how much you love each other. That's evident. It's clear. I don't know if that can always be said of the church in the world today, but it should be. Paul says that. And notice he says, it's because of the hope laid up for them in heaven that they love one another well on earth right now. Our future hope has a lot to do with our present reality. It informs or should inform our everyday lives. He says, the truth of the gospel has come to you. I would ask you, has it come to you? Has the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ come to you? How does it come to them? He says, you heard about it. Notice this, which has come to you, indeed the whole world, as it does among you since the day you heard it and understood it. He says, from the grace of God in truth, as you learned it. Notice those words. Heard, understood, and learned. What does that tell you? The gospel is something that is spoken, is proclaimed, is preached. Anybody ever heard the phrase, preach the gospel and all you do and if necessary use words? Sometimes attributed to Francis, St. Francis of Assisi, which is actually not accurate. No record they actually said that. Anybody ever heard that phrase before? Yeah? That's a terrible idea. <laughs> You're like, well, I put it on my Instagram photo. Anyway, let me tell you why. You cannot preach the gospel without words. You can't. The gospel is the Lord Jesus Christ gave his life for you on a cross where you deserve to die. He died in your place to free you from your debt of sin, to liberate you from the power of sin. He rose from the grave, assuring your salvation. How are you going to say that non-verbally? You can't. And that not only that's God's plan from the foundation of the world. Now, I, of course, believe that we should live out the implications of the gospel, that our service, our integrity, our self-sacrifice should demonstrate gospel fruit in my life. But you cannot preach the gospel without words. Paul says it. You heard it. Epaphras shared it with you, and he got it from me, and I got it from someone else. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, what I received, I passed on to you. In 1 Timothy 2, he says, this is the good deposit I'm entrusting to you. The gospel is something it's, that has been given to us verbally that we hear, that goes from our mind and our ears and our heart, and we respond to and it changes us. And we grow in, you've been taught it, you understand it. There's instruction in it, in other words. Notice also, Paul says, it's the nature of the gospel to grow. Did you catch this? It's, he says it's increasing, bearing fruit in the whole world and in you. Jesus talks about the gospel of the kingdom like a seed, that when it finds good soil, it inevitably produces a bumper crop. The gospel grows. It's what it does. Our job isn't to make that happen. God does that. Our job is to proclaim it, to share it, to live it out. It always grows. It produces something, is his point. This is what the gospel does. Listen to what John Stott says about this in his book, The Cross of Christ. Wherever the gospel of Jesus Christ has been proclaimed, we see lives change for the good, nations change for the better, thieves become honest, addicts become sober, broken marriages are restored, selfish people become selfless and generous, hateful individuals become channels of love, unjust and corrupt persons embrace justice. Yet all around us, we see Christians and churches relaxing their grasp on the gospel, fumbling it, and in danger of letting it drop from their hands altogether. He's echoing the Apostle Paul. The gospel changes things in here 
and out there. So don't lose your grip. Don't look for anything else. You already have the fullness of God in Christ and his message of grace. As a church, we've got no other message. As a pastor, I've got no other message. One of the lessons God taught me over the, the, the global pandemic, which I'm glad is in the rearview mirror now, I remember vividly, painfully, pa people asking, well, what do you think, pastor, about masks? What's your opinion about vaccines? What's your opinion about lockdowns, about social distancing? And I remember thinking, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not an immunologist. I'm not a social scientist. I don't know. And then, when, of course, the, the, the racial justice uh, uh, issue in our culture swelled to a crescendo with the killing of George Floyd, and it felt like the world was going crazy, and there were riots everywhere, and I'm, people were asking me about that. I'm like, I, I, here's what I know. I know the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I felt as if God was saying, like, really, all we've got is him. That's what we have to offer. I'm not an expert in all these things. I'm not an economist or a sociologist. And frankly, those people are often wrong, right? But I do know who the Lord Jesus is. I know what he has done. I know what that means in our lives. That's what Paul's saying in his little church in Colossae. He's saying, stay focused on what matters most. You already have the fullness of God in him. He's our mission, our message, and our whole life. This brings us to the life of the gospel. The gospel is not just a message you believe once upon a time. I think the mistake we make is we think, well, vacation Bible school when I was 12 or 15 or whatever, I prayed this prayer and that's the gospel and I've sort of moved on with my life. Uh-uh. It's an everyday power at work in us. The life of the gospel. Look at verses 9 through 11 of the text. Also, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. This is Paul's prayer. I love this part. He's describing the way he prays for them. Wouldn't you like someone to pray for you this way? Asking that you may be filled, he says. There it is again, this fullness idea. You may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Whoa, I wanna pray like the Apostle Paul someday when I grow up. Here's what he's saying. Notice these words, filled. He says, you've been filled with spiritual wisdom and understanding to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, pleasing to him, bearing fruit, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened as well. All these sort of action words here, that what the gospel is doing when Paul's prayer for them. The gospel grows and increases, it fills and strengthens you and me. Notice how he prays. I was thinking about this in my life. How do you pray, if you pray? Is it, uh, now I lay me down to sleep? I pray the Lord my soul to keep, which is a creepy prayer. If I should die before I wake. <laughs> <laughs> or is it like just prayer for meal times? If you pray for people that are in need, which I hope you do, how do you pray for them? Think about it this way. You have a friend who's out of work. Pray that they find work, that God provides a job. But pray even more that they lean into the provision and power of the gospel of Jesus in their life. What's the greater answer to prayer? What's the greater need? Is it just that they get a job or is it that they learn to trust in Christ Jesus even when they don't have a job? You have somebody in your life, a sister, a mother, a dear friend who's sick, has a bad diagnosis. Pray for their healing, absolutely. Pray and plead for their healing. But pray also that in their suffering, Christ Jesus would be glorified. That his peace and comfort would surround them and that the people who attend them and treat them would see and feel from them the gospel at work. Paul's not just praying for the circumstances here. He's praying deep, gospel-informed prayers. And I think we can learn from that. He prays for them in a powerful way deeper than their circumstances. He says that he prays that they would know God's will. How many of you want to know God's will in your life? Show of hands. Yeah, well, if your hands let up, you're just not listening to me, right? We all want to know God's will, but most of us, what we mean by that is, I want to know 
about my circumstances. What should I do about this issue? That's not really what Paul's saying here. That you be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. What does he mean? The knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, meaning that your mind and heart would be so shaped by the value system of Jesus that it would inform every decision you make. That you see the world through his eyes. For what purpose? So that you would walk in a manner worthy. How many of you think, yeah, I'm worthy? How many of you came in here today saying, yeah, I am, I am worthy? No, that's an intimidating phrase. He was like, I'm not worthy. But that's not what he's saying. He's not saying that you walk in a manner worthy in order to earn God's grace. He's saying God's grace has come to you in the gospel, and you were not worthy, but he comes to you anyway. And then, but it's, so in other words, you don't walk worthy to receive grace. You receive grace so that you can walk worthy. This is what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. He puts it this way. That I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. You've already been called. Now, that phrase sounds kind of intimidating to us, but that's what Paul's saying. Listen to how C.S. Lewis puts this in his classic Mere Christianity. Imagine yourself a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps, you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right, stopping the leaks in the roof, and so on. You knew those jobs needed doing, and so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of. Throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you're going to be made into a decent little cottage. But he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. God has greater plans for your life than you have for yourself. His agenda for who you become in him is far greater than your life plan. And sometimes it hurts and doesn't make sense, but he's at work and it's good. So Paul prays that we would have the knowledge of his will, not his will about my, my, my agenda, but my, for his agenda for my life and for the world, to see the world as God sees it. I remember talking with a man who said that he didn't think he was a good Christian or a real Christian or even a Christian at all. He says, because I should be better than I am by now. How many of you can relate to that? Well, we've all got a ways to go. But the fullness of God dwells in him. Last, the power of the gospel. Now, I want to go back and look at the, the, the end of verses 9 through 11. Look how Paul ends this. He says this, uh, this little phrase here. He says that we are, he prays for us with his court according to his power, according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. How many of you connect those three words together? Endurance, patience, and joy. How many of you think when you're stuck in traffic on the Eisenhower, ah, oh, thank you, Lord Jesus, a chance to endure with patience and joy. What a gift you give me today. How many of you, when you get to the checkout line, oh, endurance and patience with great joy. How do you seek out a chance to be delayed in your life so that you can practice endurance and patience with joy? No, endurance and patience are like, oh, I hate waiting. Like Princess Bride, I hate waiting. Get used to disappointment, right? If you know, you know. What's Paul talking about? Well, look at the next line. Here's the, this, this last passage I want to look at here when Paul says in verses 12 through 14. Go to that next slide. Giving thanks to the Father. This is the secret of joy. Giving thanks. Grateful hearts are joyful hearts. The way we endure with patience and joy is by giving thanks. For what? To the Father. Who has? I want you to notice three words. If you have your Bible, circle these three words. Qualified you to share in the heritage of his saints. Delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is crucial what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying the way we endure with patience and joy is by being grateful. Grateful for what? These three things. Christ Jesus has qualified you. You're not qualified. I am certainly not qualified to be a preacher of the word of God. I don't deserve it. I, don't earn, I didn't earn it. God gave it to me as a gift of his grace. 
He called me into his family by his grace. None of us are qualified. That's the whole point. He redeems you and blesses you and forgives you and restores you and qualifies you. You're in. You're already in. You already belong. You don't have to measure up or qualify. He has qualified you. And then it says he's, he's delivered you from the domain of darkness. That, that baggage which weighs you down, the shame or guilt or wounds of your past, he's cut you free from. You no longer carry that as a weight. He's delivered you from that power over you. And then I love this last one, transferred you. Taken you from one kingdom, darkness, and placed you, transferred into another kingdom of his beloved son. My wife and I were in Africa, and we were at the, the kind of three-country border of Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Botswana. We had been there for a mission trip. We're going to go on a little safari. We're trying to get into Botswana, which was hard to get into. And so there's this three-country border. There's uh, African men with AK-47s and fatigues everywhere. There are baboons everywhere. You know what? Bab baboons are not cute monkeys. They're kind of terrifying. And they grab your food and your backpacks if you're not paying attention. So we're like in line, stressed out, fierce-looking people with automatic weapons and baboons everywhere, waiting to get into, the, into Botswana. My wife is ahead of me, and this guy is looking, he's got his beret on and his, and his fatigues. He's looking at her, he's looking down at her passport, looking at her, looking down at her passport, looking all serious. I'm like, oh man, what's going on? We don't speak the language. Finally, he goes, chunk, <laughs> hands her her passport, smiles at us. You know, like, like, you're in, you're in, you're just in. I don't know what happened, he just let us in. In a way, Paul is saying, like, you don't deserve this. You don't even under quite grasp how it happened. But the Lord Jesus has qualified you, delivered you, and transferred you, stamped you. You belong in his kingdom. Welcome in. So Paul is saying, like, whatever comes your way, be profoundly grateful with joy that that is true about you. Your identity is in Christ. Nothing can change that. You've been brought in. Next week, we're going to look at this great passage from verses 15 through 20 of chapter 1. It's this hymn about the supremacy of Christ that the early Christians would have sung and known by heart. We're going to study it and sing it and say it together. But for today, as we launch into this letter, I'm going to go back to what Paul, the theme. Paul says, the great so what of the resurrection? The fullness of God exists in Jesus Christ, and all who are in him are filled to overflowing. Look to no one or nothing else. You already are filled up with the fullness of God in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this letter, this ancient letter, which uh, was written to people long ago to a culture very different from ours. Yet, it speaks to us of our deep need in our souls to know that we belong, that we've been qualified, delivered, and transferred into your kingdom. Help us to live that way with great gratitude and joy. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, if you're here and someone would like someone to pray with you, maybe you're facing a difficult decision and you need to know what God's will is for that or you're just feeling burdened or weighed down, members of our prayer team would love to meet with you in the glass room and pray with you and pray for you. Now, brothers and sisters, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has qualified you to share in the inheritance with all the saints who has delivered you from the domain of darkness and transferred you to the kingdom of his beloved Son. To him be glory now and forever. Amen. And go in peace.